Oh, I'm a failure because I haven't got a brain. Well, what would you do with a brain if you had one? Do? Why, if I had a brain, I could... I could while away the hours... The brain. It's the ever-elusive organ that has fascinated us since antiquity. And yet the more we come to realise about this bundled blubbery network of nerve cells, glial cells and cerebrospinal fluid, the more questions we have about it. With its grooved surface like the clints and grikes of a limestone pavement, the brain is central to everything about us. It's certainly frustrating. With each attempt to simplify its function, its structure or dynamic nature, we begin to appreciate more and more its seemingly unfathomable complexity. The whole organ is quite humbling, really. There are yellow pages upon yellow pages of jobs and services that the brain coordinates, cooperates and controls. Many of them we still don't fully understand. But intelligence, we might conclude, is one such capability. Now, the complexity of the brain doesn't just end with its biology. Intelligence, the psychological concept or phenomenon, and more specifically what intelligence exactly entails, is highly complex, or at least highly complicated and confusing. To some, it might appear like we're closer to living on Mars than we are to ever deciding on what a definition for intelligence actually is. As of 2007, there were 70 recorded and widely distributed definitions of intelligence. Renowned psychologist Orgy Sternberg even commented that in the case of intelligence, there seemed to be almost as many definitions of intelligence as there were experts asked to define it. Oh dear, it seems like everyone thinks about it slightly differently. And we haven't even gotten into the difference between intelligence and cognition. Is there even a difference? And what about intelligence versus intelligent behaviour? You can't be one without displaying the other. How are we even measuring it? It's easy to get bogged down in the semantics of it all, but for the purposes of this discussion, we're going to decide on a definition inspired by those 70 odd definitions. Intelligence is the capacity to acquire knowledge or information, as well as the ability to apply this knowledge to a multitude of scenarios, specifically ones that might require the abstraction of such information for the purpose of reasoning, planning, problem solving, learning, and memory. For instance, if we consider intelligence in an academic setting, in order to do well in an exam, you need to have the capacity to acquire knowledge related to whatever topic is on the exam. You also want to be able to actually acquire that knowledge, not just be able to do it, and then be able to draw from it in the exam to answer whatever questions are thrown at you. Later on, we'll get into why the undecided nature of the definition poses a somewhat significant challenge in synthesizing all proposed instances of intelligence. But for now, let's go back to the brain. In humans, we contend that our brain, and perhaps even more specifically, the prefrontal cortex, is attributable to our intelligent capabilities. But what if you didn't have a brain? For Frank Baum, Scarecrow in The Wizard of Oz, this was his very conundrum. He felt hopeful that the great wizard would fill the hole in his head so that he might finally scare the crows on his Munchkinland farm. Who are you? asked Scarecrow when he had stretched himself and yawned. And where are you going? My name is Dorothy, said the girl, and I am going to the Emerald City to ask the Great Oz to send me back to Kansas. Where is the Emerald City? he inquired, and who is Oz? Why, don't you know? she returned in surprise. No, indeed. I don't know anything. You see, I am stuffed. So I have no brains at all, he answered sadly. Oh, said Dorothy, I'm awfully sorry for you. Do you think, he asked, if I go to the Emerald City with you, that Oz would give me some brains? I cannot tell, she returned, but you may come with me if you like. If Oz will not give you any brains, you will be no worse off than you are now. But most living things on this planet get by just fine without one. Brains and nervous systems like ours are only a relatively recent evolutionary development. Brains of all shapes and sizes and capabilities are a hugely widespread feature of the animal kingdom, but what about the other biological kingdoms? If they don't have brains, we animals must be pretty unique. We can do so much precisely because of our brains. Things like eating, sleeping and repeating all that 
Things like knowing the chances you winning the lotto are slim to none. Things like acting intelligently. But are animals the only organisms capable of intelligence? And even still, are humans the only ones capable? Over less than a decade, it seems like the waters around this question are getting muddier by the day. More recently, it seems there's a flood of research to suggest otherwise, suggesting intelligence beyond animal systems. Some seems more persuasive than others, so more controversial than others. And herein lies the very question, do you need a brain to be intelligent? What is basal cognition? Basal cognition is the idea that cognitive traits can be applied to organisms lower in the phylogenetic tree. More interestingly, this applies to single-celled organisms and aneural multicellular organisms, suggesting that they, with animals, are also capable of cognitive function and show hallmarks of intelligent behaviour. What are these proposed hallmarks of intelligence? Proponents of basal cognition suggest learning, memory, problem solving, communication, decision making and motivation, or goal orientation as examples of such hallmarks. Plant intelligence factors into the discussion around basal cognition in the fact that plants also do not have nervous systems or brains, and therefore have traditionally been thought of as unable to act intelligently. Okay, but why are we only now noticing these intelligent behaviours? At least in the case of plants, there is the issue of plant blindness, which is the phenomenon which explains our own blindness to plant life. As well as this, there is a temporal aspect of plant blindness, which has to do with the fact that plants, for the most part, carry out actions or responses much too slow for us to observe in real time, so it appears, at least to us, that plants are static and immobile. And I mean, in the case of microbes, most of them are so microscopic that you couldn't see them with the naked eye. Not at the individual cell level, at least. Even if you squint really, really hard. Okay, so we've established what basal cognition is, but what's the evidence for it? Research into basal cognition and plant intelligence has come only recently. Even those in the field consider it still an immature area of study. But so far, some compelling cases have been made, or they've at least sparked a discussion about these issues. You'd be hard-pressed to find someone who hasn't heard of the Venus flytrap. This carnivorous plant has captured the attention of many because of its mouth-like flytrap, which can snap shut, entrapping its etymological prey. What you might not have heard is that the Venus flytrap can count. Now you're probably wondering, how on earth does it do that? The flytrap is made of two lobe structures that hang off the stem of the plant and lie open to form a cup-like shape, not too dissimilar from the cup shape you can make with your own two hands. Now imagine you've grown some hairs on the palms of both of those hands. For the flytrap, these are called trigger hairs, and it's these trigger hairs that are key players involved in being able to count. Each time these hairs are touched, say by a fly or by an animal passing, an action potential is generated. Action potentials in our own nervous system are changes in electrical potential across cell membranes of neurons in a cascading manner from one neuron to the next. They are responsible for transmitting signals up and down the body and perhaps most importantly to the brain. In a TED talk a couple of years ago, neuroscientist and science communicator Greg Gage demonstrated how this electrical signaling right. can occur in the Venus but flytrap. Can it do more? So let's go to find out. We're going to go to our good friend, the Venus flytrap here, and we're going to take a look at what happens inside the leaf when we touch, when a fly lands on here. So I'm going to pretend to be a fly right now. And now here's my Venus flytrap, and inside the leaf, you're going to notice that there are three little hairs here, and those are trigger hairs. And so when a fly lands, I'm going to touch one of the hairs right now. Ready? One, two, three. What do we get? We get a beautiful action potential. However, the flytrap doesn't close. Okay, so touching these trigger hairs generates an action potential. 
but we still haven't discussed how the fly can actually count. Or what does it even count? Does it count the number of flies caught in the trap? Not quite. It counts the number of seconds between successive touching of those hairs. And so the idea is that there's a high probability if there's a fly inside of there, they're going to be quick together. And so when it gets the first action potential, it starts counting one, two, and if it gets to 20 and it doesn't fire again, then it's not going to close. Uh, but if it does it within there, then the fly trap will close. So we're going to go back now. Why would a plant need to count the number of seconds between the generation of successive action potentials? In short, it's because it needs to be sure there's a fly in the trap or not. It's a lot of effort to open up the trap once it's closed. It can take up to 24 hours, and it's not a very efficient way of getting fed if you're just hoping at random that you've caught a fly at this time and won't have to wait another day to try again. You might be thinking, wow, even with the fly trap and its counting, it's still not a very efficient way of getting fed. Only getting fed at least once every 24 hours. Well, it turns out the flies are not the primary food source for the plant. It doesn't come as a surprise that the sun is actually that primary food source. Depending on the environmental conditions above and below the soil, the plant decides whether it needs its fly fix. In fact, it's not always the best idea for the plant to eat flies. It can only open and shut each trap a few times before the trap itself dies, which then leaves the plant one trap down and one less chance to catch flies. If you find yourself in the National Botanic Gardens and find a Venus fly trap, you can try this very experiment for yourself and see how the trap opens and shuts depending on the number of seconds between you touching its trigger hairs. Another organism that has become quite famous for its so-called intelligent abilities is the slime mold. Researchers studying the slime mold are fascinated by its ability to seemingly solve challenges like identifying the shortest path from entrance to exit in a maze, something that your average three-year-old wouldn't be able to complete, or a task like cracking the two-armed bandit code, suggesting that it would make a surprising profit at the slot machines. These all seem suspiciously crazy tasks for a protist to carry out, but the driver of such behaviours is somewhat more obvious, and for the slime mould, it's all in the name of food, or sometimes more specifically, oat flakes. What is the fastest and best way to get to my meal? What decisions can I make to ensure that happens? And how can I remember those decisions and pathways so that I can do it again if presented with a similar scenario? These are the considerations driving behaviour in the slime mould. The thing about Physarum is that it doesn't have a brain or even a nervous system, but nevertheless, it can make surprisingly sophisticated decisions. For example, slime molds can find the shortest route through a maze toward a piece of food. First, the slime mold extends its tendrils through every corridor, essentially mapping the entire maze. It then retracts every tendril that didn't find food, leaving behind a trail of slime that acts as a kind of external memory. The trail reminds the slime mold that certain corridors are dead ends. It avoids these areas and grows exclusively along the shortest path from the beginning of the maze to the tasty treat. Up to this point, we've talked about intelligence in organisms that don't have a nervous system, also known as aneural organisms. These are organisms that don't have brains, but what about organisms that have a brain but through some form of events, loses it. Planaria are a type of flatworm with a very basic neuronal system and a tiny brain-like structure in its head. And the funniest thing is that if you chop off its head, give it two weeks until there's a new one right there in its place. Safe to say, the guillotine in the French Revolution would have been entirely useless if the French royalty were anything like these planaria. The ability to grow more than one head is almost entirely unique to planaria. In particular, it's a feature that has been exploited over and over in order to investigate the extent to which this small animal depends on its brain for functioning and more specifically intelligent behaviours such as memory. Scientists carrying out these experiments noticed that when they trained a group of planaria to like a certain edible treat, like a piece of liver, the planaria would move towards the treat when it encountered it. If you cut off their heads, you'd expect this learned memory to go with it, but somehow when a new head grew back, 
they still retained this learned behaviour and moved towards the treat they knew and loved. What did the researchers take from this? Well, they concluded that in the planaria, the brain was not an essential to preserve memories. Through some other mechanism, these memories are maintained and called upon in a given scenario. Some even go so far as to say that these memories are held within each cell and that it's this collective intelligence of cells that gives the planaria that ability to remember without a brain. So now let's ask that question again. Do we need a brain to be intelligent? I think you are a very bad man, said Dorothy. Oh, no, my dear, I'm really a very good man, but I am a very bad wizard, I must admit. Can't you give me brains? asked the Scarecrow. You don't need them. You are learning something every day. A baby has brains, but it doesn't know much. Experience is the only thing that brings knowledge, and the longer you are on earth, the more experience you are sure to get. And that may all be true, said the Scarecrow, but I shall be very unhappy unless you give me brains. The false wizard looked at him carefully. Well, he said with a sigh, I'm not much of a magician, as I said, but if you will come to me tomorrow morning, I will stuff your head with brains. I cannot tell you how to use them, however. You must find that out for yourself. Oh, thank you, thank you, cried the Scarecrow. I'll find a way to use them, never fear. Do you need a brain to be intelligent? What do you think now? Have you changed your mind or are you unconvinced? If you said the latter, personally I would agree with you. At least in this discussion, I've only outlined three examples of intelligence beyond the brain, so it would be entirely reasonable to remain highly sceptical of such a conclusion. But these behaviours and arguments for intelligence outside of the brain and nervous system are definitely some interesting food for thought at the very least. Another person who remains somewhat sceptical about the arguably rapid and far-reached conclusions surrounding a neural intelligent behaviour and its place in basal cognition is Professor Kevin Mitchell. Dr. Mitchell has worked and written extensively in the field of neuroscience, neurogenetics and developmental biology, and his lab at Trinity College Dublin seeks to understand how the brain is wired early in development and beyond. More importantly, he's exactly the type of person to talk with about this research. I, I think there's a way of thinking about cognition which moves away from uh, thinking that the human version of it that we're familiar with is the only kind of form that it could take and that it, if it doesn't look like that, then it's not real cognition or it's not real intelligence. I think if we take a more neutral view, which is to say what intelligence is, is problem solving, using information about things in the environment to, um, to inform adaptive behaviors in novel scenarios. So not just reflexes that, uh, you know, that evolution could, could uh, configure into an organism where if it sees some stimulus, it just always has some response. You know, that, that wouldn't be called intelligence necessarily. Mm -hmm. But for systems that have to actually integrate lots of things that are going on, right? They, they're not just responding to one thing at a time, they're responding to lots of information. And they're in a dynamic environment that evolution can't anticipate everything that's going to show up there. So they need to be able to mount flexible behavioral responses. And in order to, to know what's the right behavioral response, they need to get information from outside in the world and integrate it in some way. And so, you know, effectively, if a bacterium is doing that, it's, it's, it's you know, encountering all kinds of dynamical changing uh, conditions in its environment. And it's integrating that information with its, also integrating with its own history and its own internal state, and basically coming to a decision about what to do, then that seems reasonable to call that cognition. It's a fairly, very basic kind of form of cognition. It's not cogitation, right? The bacterium's mm -hmm. not thinking about yeah. things. Mm -hmm. And even when I said decision, that's a kind of a loaded psychological term to apply to what's going on. But there are multiple actions that the bacterium could execute. And as a system, it selects one of those to do given the conditions and what it, it's, it's almost impossible to, to not talk in psychological terms. But uh, yeah, basically by integrating that information, what's the most appropriate 
action to take. So it seems like cognition is a reasonable term to encompass that kind of behavior. And why wouldn't intelligence then? Intelligence, I think we we use it more as a, well, you can think of it in two ways. One is just as a capacity. Something has the capacity for intelligent behavior or it doesn't, right? And, um, but it's also used as a comparator. You know, within humans, for example, some people are more intelligent than others in the sense that, you know, what we're recognizing when we use that term is that some people's behavior is more adaptive. It's better suited to achieving their goals uh, they're better at solving problems. They can integrate more information. They can plan over longer time horizon and, and so on. So it's, it always cashes out somehow in, in more appropriate behavior in more complex environments. So, you know, you could say for a bacterium that what its biochemistry enables it to do is intelligent behavior. If if your um, criterion is that it's adaptive behavior based on the usage of an integration of information. And the way that animals differ and therefore maybe display more certain signs of intelligence, is that to do with the fact that they have a brain or like neurons and a nervous system that like is quite different to like a bacterium. Yeah, well, so single-celled organisms get around in the world quite well. Yeah. They're, they're very adapted to whatever niches that they're in, right? And so they have this set of systems. They have sensors. They have motors. So the, the, the sensors can detect the, some things in the environment that they care about. So like food sources for a bacterium um, or uh, chemicals that are released by other bacteria or viruses or whatever, things that they need to know about. They've got motors so they can move around and they can also reconfigure their internal cellular physiology. And they've got some bit in the middle that is sort of integrating that information. So it's not simple isolated stimulus response mechanisms. It's a global holistic system that, that takes in lots of information at once and it's all kind of context dependent um, sort of resolution of the, the optimal um, strategy in, in any given situation. When we got the evolution of multicellular creatures, they kind of had to reinvent all of that machinery, but on, a, on the scale of a whole organism. Right? So they couldn't rely on just doing it with biochemistry because the biochemistry across a whole organism is just too slow. You just can't communicate well. Um, so they needed to invent some system that could allow them, first of all, to just coordinate the movement of all of their body parts. And then secondly, link that to a, an array of sensors, again, but they had to develop organs, not just, uh, not just proteins that could do that. And then they had to have some bit in the middle that, that integrates and sort of uh, decides what to do. So the nervous system was the, the key to doing that. And the, the really important payoff for a nervous system is that it's fast, like hugely, hugely faster mm. than biochemical signaling. And it can be done over long distances uh, skipping the bits in between, right? So you can have a nerve communicate with with a muscle that's uh, you know a meter away, uh, without uh, interfering with anything in the in the middle. Mm. So the first nervous systems were just really simple nerve nets that uh, allowed organisms like little jellyfish and stuff like that to coordinate their bits uh, and move as a whole creature. Um, but then they integrated with sensors, and then they developed over evolution more and more layers in between. And it's the layers in between that, that are the intelligent bits. Yeah. Right? So over evolution, what distinguishes different animals is that as their brains got bigger, they just got more and more levels that, that, that are separating sensors and motors. So there's more internalization of cognition um, and more levels of, ab of abstraction and information and gives them abilities to predict over longer time frames and so on. Where do you think then plants might come into that story of evolution and multicellularity? Yeah, so plants have developed entirely different systems for coordinating their bits. And the first of all, the imperatives are different for plants in the sense that um, the integrity of an individual 
is very obvious for an animal, for most animals at least. There are some that you can split in two and they'll regenerate two new things, but those are, you know, those are unusual. Uh, for plants, of course, they can, they can uh, you know, break off bits of plants and, and, and you can grow new ones, right? So there's a basic kind of a question of what even is the individual that has goals that it's trying to achieve, right? So if we're talking about appropriate adaptive behavior, then you have to anchor that by saying, well, okay, but for what, you know, from what perspective? So from a, so, so a plant's perspective is very different to an animal and it has, a, because of that life history, it has a different sets of problems to solve, but it still may have to adapt to changing conditions. Um, you know, in simple terms, it may be like the weather over seasons, for example, and of course plants do regulate their physiology and their growth um, that way. It may have to, you know, they may respond to changes in conditions during a day, like by, you know, tracking where the sun is or, um, you know, other kinds of, of reactions that they can have, say, to predators uh, and so on. So there's some pretty sophisticated behavior in plants. It just is much, much slower, right? So it doesn't, lo it doesn't strike us mm -hmm. as behavior, one, because they're not moving around, um, and two, because it's happening on a really, really slow time scale. But, you know, I think the response to predators is a really interesting example because they have some, not, not only if they, they can detect a certain predator, they can increase the levels, say, of some chemicals that they're making that are repulsive or repellent mm -hmm. for those predators. And they can even communicate to other members of their species to, to tell them that they should yeah. uh, mount that kind of a response. So you get a, a different kind of cognition, yeah. I think. It's a different flavor of control of behavior. Um, and a lot of it, of course, is it, it, it's, you get that kind of chemical responsiveness, but you also get adaptiveness, which is adaptive by growth as opposed to by movement. So, um, yeah, I think there's a case to be made for mm -hmm. plant cognition. And it's interesting to think that you can do a lot of those kind of coordinating activities without a nervous system. Uh, it's just that it, it's much, much slower. Okay, so it seems like it's reasonable to call this cognition. But what about intelligence? Well, one of the things that's interesting when you talk about intelligence is that we're usually ascribing that to an entity, right? We're saying this is an intelligent entity, and that usually implies a kind of unity to it. So there's some sort of central part of it, or the, 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 or the whole thing is is an agent and can, uh, in a unified way, act somehow. So um, when animals are doing behavior, we see that in the sense that they're doing one thing at a time. They're having to choose between different things, right? They can, they can only do one at a time. And they need some central control system in order to regulate that behavior based on what's going on out in the world. There are some people who ascribe agency and sometimes even cognition to things like embryonic development or regeneration in like simple organisms the, the ones i mentioned earlier that you can cut them in half and they'll grow into two right so that's that's sort of taking a particular stance and using a vocabulary and applying it to um, a particular phenomenon where the vo vocabulary may not match the phenomenon so well so for me um, you know, thinking for a, talking about a bacterium as doing cognition in the sense of moving around depending on what's out in the world it is reasonable. That's not, that doesn't feel like I'm stretching the boundaries of the term cognition too much. I, I'm looking at a very basic form of it, but it's still a recognizable uh, type of thing, right, that I'm talking about. Whereas for something like embryonic development, you know, the idea that it's the organism solving the problem of how to make itself or how to remake itself in regeneration feels like a stretch. It doesn't seem like the application of psychological terminology to that process is needed or adds very much. In fact, it may be kind of even anthropomorphic. Um, but the, the one thing that's that's missing, I think that's different, is the centrality or unity of, of what's going on, right? There's no, when an organism's developing, you know, different parts of the embryo are, are developing independently from each other. They're in, even the left and right sides of the body are not even much in communication with each other, you know, during development. So it's not like there's a central intelligence 
directing everything in, in executive control of what's going on. That just doesn't seem to fit as an apt way of thinking about it. Instead, you've got a, some distributed self-organizing processes that are doing amazing things, but I would say in a non-cognitive kind of a way. A wholly different domain. I think this brings up a really important question. Why the need or the rush to count all of these behaviours as intelligent? Just to refer back to something we discussed earlier on, the idea of collective intelligence. And why is intelligence the apt way to describe it? Again, it's the question of whether you just think that's a, uh, that's a process that the word intelligence should be ascribed to. And for me, I don't think it's very apt, and I also don't think it's very useful. Right? So some of these semantic debates uh, just come down actually to pragmatics. You know, if you want to call it intelligence, what's the payoff? Right? What's the benefit you get from applying that term? Does that give you a conceptual grasp of it that you didn't have before? Does it make you think of it in a way that's more productive, that opens up some experimental avenues? Um, and there I just am not convinced that it does. And in fact, I think it's potentially harmful in the way that we're thinking of it because it makes us um, apply some concepts from a wholly different domain that just may not be uh, appropriate in that, in that other domain. Yeah. In this vein, it seems like intelligence is just a buzzword. And as is often the case with buzzwords, they can be quite polarizing. No doubt this idea is quite polarizing within the scientific community. You know, many people, when they hear that someone's t applying the term cognition to plants or bacteria, just go, that's ridiculous. In fact, I did myself. Mm. First time I heard that, uh, I thought, what are you talking about? You, you're deflating the term cognition so much that it doesn't mean what you think it means anymore. Uh, but the more I thought about it, the more I thought, no, that's not, actually, that's not a reasonable scientific or philosophical position to take. Um, and my view of cognition was completely colored by high-level human cogitation, which is a, a very sophisticated form of cognition, but I don't see any reason why it should be thought of as the only kind. So it seems at least that there's a long way to go in terms of defining intelligence and also confidently applying the term and its features to aneural organisms. However, moving away from an animal and human-centric view of cognition could elucidate about its more basic traits and functions. So while Scarecrow realised that he didn't need a brain, the wizard convinced him that what he needed instead was a diploma. Back where I come from, we have universities, seats of great learning, where men go to become great thinkers. And when they come out, they think deep thoughts. They have one thing you haven't got, a diploma. Back on Earth, I think we all agree, you don't need a diploma to be intelligent. And some might even say, that you might not even need a brain. I hereby confer upon you the honorary degree of THD. <laughs> THD? Yeah, that's Doctor of Thinkology. The sum of the square roots of any two sides of an isosceles triangle is equal to the square root of the remaining side. Oh, George! Rapture! I've got a brain! <laughs> <laughs>